finale of Vanguard, Conversations with Women of Color in STEM. I'm your host and today your guest, Jadida Eisler, and I am elated to be talking to you tonight. Probably because this has been such an incredible journey through this season. For those of you who have been watching a long time, this has been our first season on air in a public way. Um, we've had an incredible set of guests come on to our show and um, give us incredible advice and wisdom uh, that they've learned along their journey. Uh, if you don't know what the show is about, if you're new and just watching the season finale, um, Vanguard STEM, Conversations with Women of Color in STEM, which we shorten with, by saying Vanguard STEM, is an ongoing rotating conversation between current women of color in STEM with emerging women of color in STEM. Uh, we're trying to like continue to open doors and open conversations to reduce the sense of loneliness and isolation that many women of color in STEM feel as they're pursuing degrees and even even as they're going on into their careers. Uh, so we're making use of the power of the internet and social media to join together these communities that are in disparate places all, all over the country and all over the world in conversations. Generally what happens on our show is that we have a panel of guests and we have a theme and we talk about that theme all uh, throughout the hour. But since we're on our season finale, I figured it'd be a really good opportunity for us to go back and highlight some of the really incredible things that we've heard um, so that if you weren't there at the beginning and you didn't watch the playlist, which of course you can now do, um, I'll make sure to put it in the description box below. Uh, you can definitely um, go back and catch up on all the, the specifics, but I wanted to really just go back and highlight um, some of the things that we talked about uh, some of the participants that we had and, and the things that they said that were really moving. Um, before we get there, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how the show began. Uh, there was an undergrad at an institution that I was at before, Syracuse University, um, who was really feeling isolated. And we decided that um, in, in addition to wanting to go out and be a mentor to people to, to, so to make sure that you know others weren't feeling isolated, that um, there was also an opportunity to mentor, be mentored by women of color uh, in STEM. So that's, that's sort of how it started and we've gone on along through this journey together and I think that um, we've really started to build community around this idea we've had lots of really good input and so the idea is to go back and talk about all the amazing things and I'm not gonna lie I'm probably gonna be a little bit all up in the feels because I've been feeling all kinds of ways today um, about this show, about the people that it has brought into my life personally, uh, about the students that um, it has impacted and young professionals who have, have told me how much of a, a blessing it's been to their life. So I feel some kind of way about this show um, and the people who have been on it. So it's my pleasure to go back and review some of the things. So the first half is gonna be a season recap. We're gonna talk about interesting things that happened during the show. The second half of the show is going to be the Ask Me Almost, see how I did there? Um, ask Me Almost Anything. And what I'm trying to use that period for is the myriad emails that I get from a number of people who, um, have asked me questions about my journey, about how I'm doing, how I did what I did, um, and just you know different questions that young women tend to come and ask me over time. So the idea is to give a public opportunity, a public forum for us to continue that conversation with the, with the understanding that you know I will try to do the best I can. I'm one person uh, trying to answer. Uh, these questions and so you should get lots of advice from a lot of different people and the other really good piece of news that we are also going to come back next season so we are um, we're going to be available uh, through our Twitter account which is Vanguard STEM will also be in our Facebook group uh, but the show itself won't return until after the new year so we're giving you the holidays off so you're welcome um, so that's that's that um, and 
we'll probably get into more of the details with what you know what's going to happen with the next season at the end of the show but i just wanted to give you a sense of what things are going to look like through the show so we'll go through a recap and then we'll talk a little bit about whatever your questions are for me so the way that you're going to send those questions to me is through twitter you can use the hashtag vanguard stem uh, vanguard stem or you can use the question and answer box in the google hangout window that's actually um another really good way to interact with me so that I see your questions and can answer them appropriately. You can ask those questions all through the show. I will try to answer them as we go, especially if they relate to the recap that I'm giving. So if you know you have a question about something we talked about in a given show and you want to talk about that, shoot me a message and I will um, address it as quickly as I can. So we are going to do this together, you and I, because we're you know we're Vanguard family, and that's what family does. Aren't you excited? I'm excited. Okay. Um, all right. So we started episode one in September. No, September. I don't remember, y'all. Was it September? I think it was September. Uh, with Dr. Catherine Espelot, Catherine Espelot, uh, Chinwe Nayenke, and Janine Uzel. Uh, the theme of that show was beginnings. And we talked about first the beginning of Vanguard and how the show came to be, which I've now told you about, but also about their beginnings, like how they felt like they got on their paths. Um, what they felt like they learned as they were going through and, and things like that. And so, you know, I went through and listened. I did my marathon watching of the show. And so uh, that's why I'm all up in the fields because there's so much good stuff in there um, from the guests that, that came on. And so some of the things that people talked about was being clear or getting better at knowing the fact that, you know, as you're getting on the path, you may not know exactly what you want to do as you're beginning and as you're getting started. And that's okay. That's not an isolated occurrence. Many of us are trying to figure it out as we go. And so, you know, the one thing we wanted to say is that you've got to be comfortable in your own own skin and and that's not a trivial thing you know it sounds easy it's something that you know people like to memify and put on you know all kinds of backdrops and put on social media but it's actually not super easy especially at the beginning I um, mean this is where we start to talk specifically about being a woman of color in stem where we, where we occupy that intersectional space which doesn't always fit into the the notions that exist before we get there about what we should be doing so we've got to um, find out what's interesting to us and then try to continue learning about that while also just remaining comfortable in our own skin there was some talk about being underestimated and feeling like you know not knowing if that was because of our identity or actually most people do know that it's it's often because of their identity because uh, as women of color understand we're often underestimated um, and often have to prove things repeatedly um, but many many um, people talked about in that panel so Catherine and Chinwei and Janine talked about you know making space for themselves um, and not allowing critiques that may be levied against them as they're learning or as they're getting to the place that they want to be to reside in their inner self right like that just because you have said this thing about me it does not make it true and it doesn't mean it's something that I have to take into myself um, and role models came up very prominently in the conversation about beginnings, which makes sense, right? Um, when I asked all of the women about their experience, about how they get started, what made them interested in you know, astronomy or mechanical engineering or aerospace engineering, um, all of them had role models that they felt like either at the beginning really helped them along or as they were going, they just they found people that were in pursuit that were helping them. Uh, Mae Jemison came up, we all expressed our you know, uh, corporate uh, love for her and 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 her um, feat of being the first uh, black woman and woman of color in space uh, but how like seeing that role model like having that example of success in a stem field really motivated people to say oh not only can this be done but someone like me does it uh, so we talked a lot about role models so if you're at the place where you're thinking about what you want to do be looking around for role models it, it often helps with that role model shares one or all of your identities um, but because we are small in number uh, right now as women of color and stem we are not invisible and we are not a you know we are not minuscule we are a small group but we are we are here y'all know how i feel about that we are here don't play games 
Um, but you know, if you find that you get people who want to be role models for you and, and who want to help you along that don't aren't don't share your identity, be open to that as long as they are in support of what you're doing. And I thought that that was a really important point, right? Um, when, when you look at your, your support system, which we'll get to more in a second, uh, you want to make sure that you have people that actually believe in the work that you're doing. So when we were talking about beginnings, we talked a lot about having that aspirational role model, having that person or people that you look up to that you're like, wow, if they can do it, I can do it. Um, and then as you're getting going along the, 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 the walk, you start to pick up people that can help you do that. Um, so that was a lot of, of, of what we talked about. Catherine in particular made a, a comment about um, seeing someone you can relate to in these, in these uh, roles. The other thing that really came up and we talked a lot about is the idea of unicorns, right? Um, and if we are or aren't unicorns and what that means. And I sort of bristle at the term because again, it sort of makes some space or creates some space for the sense that one is alone. And often we're not alone, we are just small in number and the support systems and the networks that, we're, that we've built just because they aren't you know, huge and overarching and you can't see them all the time doesn't necessarily make them invisible, which means we're, we aren't necessarily unicorns. We are, um, and I guess the way we said it on the show was, uh, if we are unicorns, then we're this at least a stable, you know, like it's not just one. Um, and I thought that, that was a really um, important thing. The other uh, piece about, you know, getting into that beginning is learning to navigate through the sense of emotions that comes through it. You know, um, one of the things I wanted to underline about some of our conversation is that, you know, none of the states of mind and the ways that we proceed and behave in the world are permanent, right? Some days we have good days, some days we have bad days, and we have to be aware that those things happen. And so when you know, you're having a day and you're starting out or you're trying to learn something and you're going well, then great, keep going, you know, uh, find your mentors, find your role models, get all excited. But if you're not, um, if you're not having a good day, then it's okay to just take some time out, uh, spend some time um, getting yourself together, doing some self-care and, and trying not to assign permanent descriptions of your um, experience if you're not having having a great day. So I thought that that was really some, some those are some of the really high points for that first episode um, that can really help with, you know, getting started. Find some role models, find some people that you can identify with, whether or not they share your identity or identities, or if they are just motivated and encouraged by you and want you to see you succeed. Find that um, pass with people and help them help you get started on the thing that you want to do. Episode two was about finding your way. Uh, we had on there doctors, everyone was a doctor on this episode. So I'm gonna say big doctors at the beginning and then I will tell you their names. Uh, it was Deanna Williams, Sabria Stukes, Johnny Moore Dotson, and Giovanna Guerrero Medina. We had an incredible conversation just about, you know, once you've gotten started, we've begun this thing, but how do you find your way? And that conversation, we spent a lot of time thinking about how if we could get information about the different STEM careers out to women of color in particular, but really students in general, um, earlier and more broadly, then students would have the opportunity to find these other interesting fields in that they could consider, right? You know, so uh, we talked about how all of them do, do or have done some sort of biology related things and how as a result, most of them started thinking that they wanted to be doctors because, you know, someone said, oh, well, you're good in STEM, you should be a doctor. Uh, and it wasn't until like someone along the way, again, you know, it's these people that come along the way, someone along the way was like, oh, well, you know, if you want to do that, you should consider working in a lab. And it was like, a lab? What's that? I want to do that. Right. And so then they got the experience in the lab. I was like, wow, there's a whole world of things out here that I could do um, that doesn't necessarily involve me being a doctor. So let me just state here explicitly and for the record that I am not saying that there is anything wrong with medicine. I mean, of course, black holes are absolutely the coolest thing in the universe. We know that. That's, you know, a side issue. But um, the idea is that students should have the opportunity to pursue the full 
param explore the full parameter space of STEM careers that they are and the way that they can actually find their way through to the thing that really motivates them and is their passion is to get them more experience and exposure earlier. So we talked a lot about how to produce that kind of exposure. We talked about, um, uh, Giovanna said this thing that I thought was really beautiful. She talked about how trajectories are not linear. Um, and we you know, commiserated over the sort of false image of complete success that bios often portray about people because you read them and it's like, oh, you know, this person did this and then they did this and then they went over here and did this. They won three awards and then they're now they're here standing in front of you being awesome. Right. And you read that and you're like, wow, they have their stuff together and I have no idea what I'm doing tomorrow. Right. But the, the bio is a compilation of your best hits. Right? Nobody writes in their bio. Oh, and then I spent six months trying to write this paper because I didn't know how to code this one little piece, which happens. That happens all the time. It's just not in our bio reel. So as we're trying to find our way, we need to recognize that that experience is um, nonlinear, that it doesn't happen um, all in one line. It doesn't happen all in the same direction. We you know, go in fits and starts. We figure things out as we go. The example that um, one of the women gave uh, Sabria, actually, she was talking about how, you know, she started out in this one lab and she, it was exactly what she thought it was, you know, she, it was exactly what she thought she wanted to do. But then once she got in there and she was doing it, she was like, actually, no, I want like absolutely like none of this, like zero percent of this do I want. Right. And I had that same experience. I, I got to do it was, it was it was a lot of fun in terms of, you know, like meeting people and whatever. But I did a summer internship in um nuclear engineering, which was cool, but it just wasn't what I wanted to do. It wasn't what I was passionate about. And so if you looked at my, you know, internship trajectory, it, you know, it had turns and twists and fits and starts just because I needed to find the thing that I wanted to do or for, in my case, confirm that it was exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and the other thing that, that was really important out of that episode was that there's no like golden book. There's no answer that has, this is how you do this thing and this is how everyone does it. Number one, that's not the case because literally every person's story is different. There's, we all have a different way of arriving to things, a way of figuring out what we want to do, um, different, you know, temperaments and personalities. And so there is no standard story. And I think that that's actually one of the most menacing problems that we have with how we define how STEM is done in the world. Like it, we create this narrative that this, there is a one path and if you are not on it, then you're not successful. Uh, there are several problems with that. Number one, uh, there is not one path that's just false, right? So like the, we're, we're starting on a false premise. Uh, but number two, um, often these you know standard trajectories don't apply to people of diverse backgrounds. So they don't apply as well to uh, women of color in STEM. They don't apply as well to students of color in STEM. They don't apply as well to students who are disabled or uh, students who are uh, neurodiverse. They just you know students who are LGBTIQ. They, they just these standard narratives don't generally work for um, different people. And so not only is it just not true that for, you know, the like standard person, uh, it doesn't work because everyone has their own trajectory. But even if it were something that would work, it generally doesn't work that same way for um, marginalized or underrepresented groups. And so, you know, I thought that was a really important thing to come out of it, because if you as you're going through your path, can recognize that number one, your path is your own. It's going to be unique to you and that's okay. Um, and that that's not a failing. That's not a moral failing. That's not uh, an intellectual failing. It just is the way it goes. Then it allows you to give yourself some space to be like, oh, this is not me being a whole person. This is just me finding my way. This is how I get uh, to where I'm going. So I'm going to um, take a quick break um, to give you a a chance to ask some questions because uh, I see some coming in. So let me just answer um, a question or two uh, that that's here. Um, let's see, what role do I see HBCUs playing in advancing STEM education? It's a great question. Um, let me, let's see, let me give you a quick answer to that and then I'm going to circle back around. Um, my quick answer to that is I think HBCUs are 
critical to the role of developing uh, uh, STEM STEMists, STEM practitioners of color, um, and particularly women of color in STEM. I think that they are fertile grounds for young people to figure out who they are and to um, hopefully encounter less of the isms that um, they, they might face in other situations. Um, I'm thinking particularly about, you know, some of the uh, racial encounters or racial discriminations uh, that, that they may face. Now, you know, HBCUs aren't perfect, and so, you know, do we still deal with issues of sexism and, you know, all kinds of other things that are happening, but I do think, and, and, and that full disclosure, I'm biased. I went to two HBCUs and love them, uh, but I think that they are critical components in producing um, STEM practitioners of color. And that's just not, that's not just my own opinion. Um, the, the numbers bear that out, that if you look at um, the PhDs of color, black PhDs in particular, um, in the country, uh, and you look at their academic lineage, that is where they went to undergrad, where they went to graduate school, things like that, um, nine out of the ten, 10 of them, nine out of the top 10 schools that produce these PhDs were HBCUs at some level. So most of the time they went through, um, an HBCU as an undergrad, right? So they are critical um, uh, pieces of, of the story of uh, students of color in, um, in, in uh, STEM. So thank you for that question. Let me, um, and, and I will circle back to it if that's not a significant, uh, a, a, that's not enough of an answer for you and you want some more, I will come back to that at the end. Um, episode three, we talked about transitions, and this one was a really um, impactful episode. Let me first just say that we had a transition of one of the people on the transition show. So on our show, we had um, Dr. Centrica Eaton, Dr. Monica Fabi Mohair, and then we had Liz Wayne, who was about to defend her thesis. And we now have Dr. Liz Wayne, who has successfully defended and is has joined the ranks of Black women PhDs in the country. So congratulations to you. We're so excited uh, that you are now part of the fold. And I'm cheering on those of you who are working on it now and finding your way to your PhD um, or wherever your, uh, your STEM dreams do ultimately take you. So, um, the transitions conversation rung really true because it spoke a lot to trusting your gut, right? Um, and this is a hard one. And actually one of the things we ended the episode saying was that it gets easier to make transitions and to trust your gut as you go. Because what happens is, you know, something will happen and there's a fork in the road and people will say, hey, do you want to go left or do you want to go right? And then you'll have, you know, seven people say you should go right. I mean, absolutely. Right is the way to go. And then you'll have nine people say, actually, most people go left. And so you're probably going to want to go left too, right? And so you're left sort of sitting in the middle of what seem to be less helpful indications of what you, what you should do. But if you can find a way to be true to what is inside of you to do and believe that what you would like to do actually matters, then you can find the place to say, actually, when I started this out, I had a, a penchant. I, I really wanted to go right because I, this is just how I felt. It was deep in my core. It's what I wanted to do. As I've gotten more information, I've been actually really pretty compelled to go to the right. And so you get to this place where you get comfortable enough with yourself that you can say, you know what, I really appreciate all of the advice that you've given me on all these different subjects. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. I've got to go right because that's what my gut says. And so we spent a lot of time talking about um, getting to that sense of confidence in yourself and confidence in your dreams and valuing those just as much as you value other people's opinions, right? And other people's senses of what you should do. So that was, you know, one of the big things that came from that, that, um, that episode. And, and the other thing, uh, and Liz actually said this, is that no one makes transitions alone. This is where we really started to underscore the notion that People, we have to have support systems, and those support systems also go through transition. So you need a, a passel of people that are around that are willing to give you advice and encouragement and critique you and whatever that you trust to give you the right answer, right? Like that's 
a critical component because, you know, we aren't omniscient. We don't actually know everything all the time about all things. That's why we have people around us uh, who have proven themselves to be trustworthy that can help us do that. And that set of people, which is small, that was another thing that we talked about, um, that it's a small cadre of people that can really be in that inner circle of supporting you and helping you get to where you want to go because there are only so many people that you can tell the whole story to, right? Like at some point, you've just got to have this small cadre of people that really help you get to where you're going. And then you use those people to help you navigate the thing. But at the end of the day, you've got to come back to center and be able to answer the question for yourself. So um, that was a big, 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 big part of the conversation that like some point you've got to find your, your center. You've got to make the decision despite all the different voices that you hear. Uh, to help with that was the idea of decoupling your identity from your progress. It's not the case that how, you know, how far ahead or how far behind you are is a st statement of your value on the planet. It is a statement of the work that you're doing. You've got to maintain some, some distance as you're doing this transition because what will happen is you'll look to your left and you'll look to your right. Did I do that backwards? I, no, I did it right. Look to your left, look to your right. And you might see um, people that are either moving ahead of you or maybe they're, they're not moving as fast as you or they're just in different spaces. It's like, oh, goodness, should I be doing something else because everybody else is doing something else. Um, this is where finding your your key helps you do that. Um, and so I thought that was a really uh, powerful thing to say. And then we also pointed out, real talk, every decision you make, every transition you make isn't going to be good, right? It isn't going to be the right decision. You're not going to just like miraculous be able to make all the right decisions all the time. Nobody does that. And that's okay. So, you know, while we're talking about here are the ways you make good transitions and here's, you know, how you make good decisions about transitions, all these things. Yes. A lot of times you will and you're lucky and that's amazing. And sometimes you won't. And those experiences are just as powerful as the ones where you do make a good decision. Uh, so keep in mind that just because you make, just because the decision turns out not to be the one you thought it was doesn't make it a bad decision. In fact, we learn quite a bit. I would argue almost as much if not more from <laughs> decisions that didn't go quite the way we thought they should um than decisions that do so just be mindful that that is that is sometimes the case that you don't necessarily always get to transition into um the decision that you thought you would and that does not mean uh that the world is going to end we are going to get to a place where it's going to be okay uh, if you have questions about some of the things i've said i'm sort of again, doing sort of a high level look at our conversations, uh, please do ask them. I'd love to hear your feedback, your thoughts, your, if you have uh, additional advice that you want to throw in, let me know. I'd love to hear it. Uh, put it either in the question and answer um, box in the Google Hangout or use the hashtag Vanguard STEM and I will see it and I will comment on it. So let's see. Um, Oh, I did want to say there were a couple of takeaways that um, came from that transition episode, and then I'll, I'll get to our the, the failing and step episode. Um, but one of them was that, you know, you will get better, and I said this at the beginning, you will get better at making transitions as you go. The first time you have to, like, make a decision when you have, like, a split verdict on, like, what you should do. It's like, oh my goodness, it's the pits. Your stomach gets all, you know, shaken up and you're like worried, a little sweaty. I'm like, oh God, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, and then you make the decision and it works or it doesn't. Let's assume it works. And then you're like, wow, I actually made a really good decision that time. I'm going to do that again, right? You just, you just do it again and you find over time that you just get confidence get more confidence in your ability to make your own decisions and, and not view those decisions or your personal beliefs or feelings as worse or less than because they're different, right? Different doesn't mean bad. It just means different. And so you just get better at it over time uh, to the extent where like, you know, stuff will come up and it'll be like, well, what do you think? It's like, okay, what do you think? Okay, great. What do you think? Uh-huh. All right. So here's what I'm going to do, right? And it's not because you're not listening. It's just you get much better at being able to take information, process that information, see how it fits and feels with you, and then make a decision. So um, that's definitely 
uh, a part of the conversation that I think um, was really motivational, that you definitely get better at making tough decisions as you go. Um, and then just in case you really wanted to stay in that comfort zone when you're making your transitions, when you're figuring out you know, where you want to be and what your goal is, nothing amazing has ever come from the comfort zone. Like you have to get out of your comfort zone in order to get into the thing that's gonna just like move you. And I really like to point that out because sometimes we like to sit right in the middle of that comfort zone and try to make magic happen. And, and it turns out that magic is like allergic to the comfort zone. So you really have to come out of the comfort zone in order to make magic happen. Uh, so I really love to hear how you're doing that, you know, cause I know many of you are doing some really amazing, interesting things. And so how did you get yourself out of the comfort zone? How do you stay out of the comfort zone so that you can actually get your magic happening? So I'd really love to hear about that. So our fourth episode of Vanguard STEM was about a hashtag that one of our viewers um, and all around awesome Vanguard STEM women and Vanguard alum, Nicole Cabrera Salazar, uh, came up with was the failing in STEM hashtag. So we talked a lot about um, how she came up with it and what, what she wanted to do. And we were accompanied by Dr. Christine Grant, who uh, has written a book on success strategies from women, women in STEM, right? And so this idea that like there are many people who um, feel right now that they have, you know, had a failure or had some problem um, pursuing their STEM goal, and how do you pick yourself up and keep going from it? And uh, then we had someone who wrote the book about that same question, right? And so we talked a lot about. Um, feeling alone or feeling like one has to hide their uh, failure, right? Like everybody fails regularly, like we just do. Um, and it's a shame that we don't talk more about it. Uh, and that's where Nicole came up with this failing STEM hashtag, which went viral, you know, it got covered by Buzzfeed and by um, Nature and, you know, a number of press outlets because what happened was people were getting on Twitter and talking about what they had failed at and then how they had recovered. Right. And, and, and that is the critical part. Like we are all going to have failures. We're all going to do things. We're going to mess them up. Um, and how do you pick yourself up from that? And how can you um, give yourself the mental space to not necessarily um, connect that to who, like who you are? Right. Like you can make a mistake without it impacting who you are. And so I'll give you an example from this week of um, me failing. I want, I am writing a paper uh, as I want to do because that is what we do. And I wanted to get that paper out to my group on Monday. As you will note, today is Tuesday. That paper is in my bag. It's just not done yet. Uh, and so, you know, that was a goal I had set up for myself. I had sort of told them, hey, you should look out for this paper on Monday. I'm going to get it to you. And I just, I hit a wall over the weekend. I was exhausted and I did nothing. I'm just, I'm stating it out into the universe for reasons passing understanding. <laughs> I just didn't do it. Um, uh, and so now I'm working on it still and it's something that I have to recover from. And there was a time in my life where that would have literally just like, floored me. I'd have been like, oh my gosh, my group is going to hate me and they're going to, you know, kick me out and I'm just not worthy to be an astrophysicist and, you know, woe is me. And now I'm like, I didn't, I was exhausted. I'm doing a lot of things and I was tired and I didn't have it in me to do. This is not a statement of my intellectual ability or my moral compass. It's just, I didn't make the deadline. I'm just going to keep working to make that deadline. And I brought the paper home. I'm going to work on it after we get off this call. Um, and you just keep going, right? Like things happen like that all the time. And, and that's just a part of the process. So I'd love to hear more about what you're thinking about that. Do you think that it's um, something that you've gotten, that you've had experience with? Do you feel like that has an impact on your uh, being a woman of color? That was one of the things that came up. Do people feel more like their failures are um, scrutinized because they are a woman of color? And even beyond whether or not they're scrutinized by someone else, do you feel like your failures or your you know, mishaps are um, worse because you are a woman of color? Um, so that was the other you know, thing that we, we sort of grappled with. And the research shows that 
as you are perceived by others, often being a woman of color STEM means that you pay a higher price when you make a mistake. Um, but I think the thing that hasn't been said very well, at least from what I found in the literature, is that you know, as you build your self-concept, as you figure out who you are in the world and what your value is, then you can start to decouple that assessment, which is often exaggerated from who you actually are. So that's another um, piece of the puzzle that um, we talked about. So overall, as you can see, like we had an incredible set of women who gave us amazing advice. And I, I will make sure to put the uh, full playlist of the first four episodes, plus this one, in the box below once it goes on YouTube. So you should totally watch that um, and give me feedback. Tell me what you think. Um, but but there was just so much sharing of, you know, the inner workings of uh, women of color as they proceed along their STEM pathway. And I think that that's very important because it allows us to shine a light on a very real, vibrant, amazing, beautiful, brilliant community of, of STEMists um, that we exist, that we're out here. So my hope is that you picked up a lot of keys and cues from the, the four episodes and, and maybe even the highlights in this one that will encourage you to go back and watch them and that we can go on next season um, and, and do even more awesome stuff. So um, that's our recap. But now it's time for us to chat. You and I, we're, we're kicking it together. Um, so um, send along your questions uh, for what you would like to ask me since I'm here hanging out. Um, I have some that I collect in the email, so I'll definitely be reading those as well. But we're going to start with um, what you send me. So let me just go over here and look really quick. OK. Um, one of the questions is about um, the idea as, of STEM education as a form of social justice, and how do you see STEM advancing the cause of equality? It's a really good question. It's a really good question. Way to start it easy for me, thank you so much. Um, okay, so I actually started the engagement portion of my career based on this premise that um, STEM could be used as a means of social justice. Uh, and the reason that I think that's true is because number one, uh, we live in a technology-driven society. And so basically all of the interventions that are going to be most impactful as we go forward in um, our sort of shared journey as humans is going to be informed by technology. Uh, some people think that's a good thing. Some people think that's a bad thing. But the truth is it is going to be informed by technology. Um, the major impacts and, and um, interventions on our society will have some technology or STEM component, whether that's things like you know DNA editing with sort of CRISPR, whether it's um, Mars exploration um, and the sort of ecosystem of both engineering and scientific um, um, uh, advances that we, we need from there. Uh, there are so many different personalized medicine. There are so many different um, cases that really require STEM to make the world a better place. I'm thinking also of you know these some of the apps that are uh, for recording pre police brutality and things like that, right? Like that is a that is an active combination of technology with social justice. But I think just the pursuit of STEM degrees is also um, useful for social justice because it, it allows one to have a proficiency. Those proficiencies allow for um, a more analytical assessment of everything, right? Like it's not just that, you know, I'm an astrophysicist and so I am very good at analyzing astrophysics. No, it makes me a better con um, consumer of information about um, the products that I eat or the places that I go or excuse me, um, the political arena or what, like it just gives you a, a tool kit of things that you can use to analyze the larger world around you. I think that's really important. And because the, some of the major decisions about what our world is going to look like depend on who's sitting at the table and the people sitting at the table need to have a STEM uh, 
bona fides. They need to have STEM, STEM credentials. And so I think by having women of color in STEM, students of color in STEM, uh, disabled students, LGBTIQ students, you know, like students of very diverse backgrounds included, not just there, but included in the conversation informs the policy that we set up for the world going forward. And it informs the questions that we view as interesting or important going forward, right? So it's, it's, it's a number of things uh, that, that for me makes STEM um, a critical part of social justice uh, and that the pursuit of those goals uh, allows for changes in the way that we engage the world. And I should also say, you know, another critical component to that for me is the, the idea that as we learn and, and get more information, we change the ecosystem right around us. So like in our family and in, you know, in our nuclear family, uh, where nuclear is very broadly defined, uh, you know, those nearest to us uh, and to our, you know, the community around us, right? Like we impact that space as we get education, right? Like I know uh, people who know me well, who have been impacted by what I do uh, and have, have pursued degrees in you know or, or the track they, they haven't quite gotten to the degrees yet but have pursued degrees in these fields right and, and that's a powerful thing that like you by getting your degree in whatever it is you want to do or, or 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 obtaining proficiency in whatever it is you want to do actually make a way for the people around you that is a social justice issue right so it's 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 you it's the impact you have on the world and the impact you have on those around you that really starts to change the way that we interact with the world around us. So I think STEM is, is very critical um, to the idea of social justice and can be very much a part of the conversation towards equality. So thank you very much for that question. Let me see if there are other questions. One of the questions that I got an email, um, and I actually get it a lot and I wanted to address it, it may actually even be an episode, is about motivation. So I get lots of questions about, you know, how do you stay motivated? You know, how did you make it this far? You know, things like that. And, um, and it sort of goes back to something we talked about on the show, so I'm certainly not alone in this perspective, but the first thing is that motivation is not a fixed quantity. It is not, you know, a variable that you set once and then that's just it. Motivation high, done. Like that's just not how it goes. Motivation is is like a roller coaster. It is something that sometimes you're up and you're like, you could do it all. You could write all of the code and you could do all of the programming and you could do all of the pipetting and you could do all of the everything, like all of the STEM things you could do, right? Um, and then some days you just can't get out of the bed, right? That's, that's just how motivation goes. Um, but for me, the thing that has been enduring is that I believe deeply in the work that I do. I believe that it's important. It's important to me personally. I just think it's an interesting science question, but it's also important to the larger work that I want to do because of the question that was just asked about STEM equality and social justice, right? Like then I, I have to pursue this because I think that my contribution to the world um, does impact in equality in, in the space by doing the work, by being a black woman that does astrophysics, but that also talks a lot about inclusion and equal opportunity, right? And that, you know, having a diverse set of people doing those things brings about that kind of stuff. Like all of that is important to me. So it's true, some days I am not 100% and I, and I don't make very much progress on my work, but I tend to come back around to it because I care so deeply about what I'm doing. And I think that's a thread that many people talked about. And in fact, we've had some Twitter conversations about that before that, you know, it's not the case that everyone is always 100% in love, you know, and oh gosh, I love this. This is so amazing. It's just the best work ever. No, it's not always like that. Um, but fundamentally, I do always love my work. I think it's interesting and compelling. Um, so, you know, so when you think about motivation, it's less that, you know, you just have it and you always have it. And, you know, if you don't have it, then there's something wrong with you. No, sometimes we have more, sometimes we have less. I mean, we just have to negotiate that space as we go. Um, and, and I think that's an important thing as, you know, you're getting started or as you're continuing to go that like, 
it is not expected that you love what you do 100% of the time. No one expects that from you. No one feels that way 100% of the time. And if you do, I think you might be an imaginary friend. And so that's cool for you, but not quite real. Like people are not always happy with what they do, but if you always believe that what you do is important, then you'll find a way to circle back. Now, as you go, if you notice that, you know, man, it's been a while since I found this interesting, then it may be time for you to transition into something else. And that's okay too. Cause again, it's trusting your gut. If that's the case, then you sort of generally we have, you know, indications inside ourselves that, you know, it's time to move on. This isn't what I want to do. And that's okay. That's not failure. That's just transitioning. Um, we had a recent conversation on Twitter about this idea of, about, you know, like, you know, when do you, and it was, it was specifically a post question, but it was, when do you decide to give up? Right. If it's not working, when do you decide to give up? And and that question was, you know, really um, surrounding like giving up as in leaving the field. Um, and I, I sort of wish that there was a Vanguard episode about it right then, because, you know, any of the the women that I had on during the season would have said, well, it would have said what I said, because we've talked about it on the show in, in other um, capacities that like just because you leave the field doesn't make you a failure right? The skills that you have, no one can take away from you. And those skills will serve you well for the duration of your life and your career, no matter what you choose to do. So it's never a failure if you leave the field. It's also not the case that um, not being whatever it is that you've gotten a degree in means that you're a failure. Um, and, and the way that I uh, uh, talk to this woman about the subject is that, you know, sometimes it's, it's just time. It's time for you to go and do something else just because you're ready. Like your psyche is ready for you to go and do something else. Um, and that's okay. And, and sometimes there's an additional price. Again, this, this notion of, oh, well, you know, if, and I actually myself felt this, like if I, as a black woman, don't do this thing all the way through, then someone's going to assume that, oh, well, black women can't do this thing. Right. Uh, and so I better keep going so that people think that black women can do this. Whereas, you know, maybe a white colleague might go through it and say, well, I don't want to do this. And it's just OK, because that person doesn't want to do it. Right. It's, it's sort of carrying this weight of like me having to carry my identity instead of my individuality. And, and, and so when I was t answering this question about giving up, I wanted to really push on this notion that like, you have a right to change your interests and to change what you want to do as well. It, it actually isn't any worse for you to do that just because you are who you are. You have a right to be an individual, to find that thing that you want to do, to do that thing. And if that thing changes, you have a right to change too, right? Like all of that is a part of the, the evolution of oneself in in, in whatever you end up doing. Uh, so I, I wanted to just get to that as, um, as sort of one of the questions that, uh, or topics that came up recently that was super interesting. Um, the other um, thing that came up in email uh, that I'll just address here is how to, like a very specific question about um, how to get into the field of astrophysics. Um, and, you know, this one, I'll tie back to the finding your way conversation uh, that had to do with, you know, getting started early and often. Uh, and so I will talk about astrophysics, but it really applies to basically any STEM field. You'll want to get into some age appropriate activity um, that will allow you to get a sense of what that field does. So I have known high school students who have written college professors and asked if they could come and work in their group. I am a huge fan of this. Uh, because it gives you early exposure before you're committed, before you really need to, you know, say, do, or be anything specific in the world. It allows you to go and get some experience. Uh, different schools have different policies about it, but it is always worthwhile to just ask, hey, you know, I'm a senior in high school and I really want to know about astrophysics. So can I come and just maybe sit in your group meeting or come and, you know, press buttons for you or, you know, do some elementary coding or whatever. Can I come and learn from you so that I know a little bit more about what research in astrophysics is about, right? If you're at the undergraduate level, I would consider something like um, 
an internship in astrophysics, do a research experience for undergraduates. That happens in all different fields, not just astrophysics. So try to get one of those. Uh, if you're in, oh, you take some classes if your institution has it. If they don't and you can um, cross register at another institution, consider doing that. Uh, you could take the, these online courses. Uh, the, we are in the age of the inter, interwebs. And so there are many, many places that you can go uh, for information about a field. And um, as soon as you can, connect to someone who is in it so that they can help you do that work. Um, if you're in graduate school, you know you already want to do it. Like, I just, <laughs> you already know. So you, you know what to do there. Um, I will say that graduate school is also a really good opportunity to um, build up other skill sets. This is something Liz and Monica talked about in their panels about, you know, they knew that they wanted to do some additional things. Um, and so they took classes for science communication. They took classes for you know program management or whatever because those classes were not part of their program, and because they wanted to do something different than you know maybe the st standard track, uh, they went ahead and and built up proficiencies for themselves. So that's something you can definitely do. Um, all along, right? Like you can always be um, taking classes uh, or learning new material, maybe that's outside of your purview, uh, in the in the to to the aim that it's going to help you get to where you ultimately want to go. Because you're creating, as we just just talked about, you're creating a narrative for yourself um, that isn't going to be like anyone else's, and especially you know with the advent and sort of proliferation of social media, this is not something that anyone maybe, you know, more than five years into their career is really gonna know how to face. So you are leading the charge in this arena that you're in uh, to be a, an impactful scientist who's also savvy in social media, if that's your thing. But my point there is that, you know, that's a new path. No one knows how to do that yet. We're making that up as we go. And so you can use those kinds of proficiencies, those things that you're really good at um, to help you build exactly the career that you want to build. And as you do that, and as you walk in that way, it makes space for you and for others, but mostly for you. I'm, 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 I'm concerned about you as an individual because I want to make sure that you get to the place you want to be and you get to do the things you want to do. And you know, I guess that's a good, let me just make sure, um, that's a good place to, to sort of bring us back to full circle, that ultimately the reason why we started um, Vanguard STEM is to create a space for people to have conversations, candid conversations about, you know, what they're doing and, and, and how they got there. And did it find any way to, did, did, did one find any way to negotiate that space? Because we are a community. We have um, people that have been extremely successful as women of color in these STEM fields, both inside the academy, in the industry, in entrepreneurship. Uh, one of the women that we're recording for next year uh, is a coach. She has a PhD in chem chemical engineering, and she's a life coach, right? So she helps to coach students um, and programs about how to engage uh, diverse populations, right? Like, so the world is your oyster and the conversation is to help you get there, is to help you craft it and help you make that space for what you want to do and be in the world. So um, that's what Vanguard uh, is. Uh, I thank you so much for joining me on the, on the recap and for your questions. Uh, they were really great questions. Some of them were pretty hard, but I appreciate them. They were great. Uh, and so, you know, I want to take this opportunity to invite those of you who have been watching through the season. First of all, thank you so much for watching, uh, for tweeting, uh, for participating in the show as we're building it and making it happen. And so I have a survey that I'd really love for you to fill out. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop that survey into the Facebook group um, and I'm going to mention it on Twitter and I'll put it in the description box below so that you can um, 
click on it and fill it out. I'd really love your feedback. The whole team, which is small, but we are here. Y'all know how I feel about that. Um, we will take that and chew it up and figure out how to um, make the season better next year. Uh, we've got some really exciting things coming up for you. We can't wait to start to share them with you to, for you to see um, what they're going to look like. One of them might even be a meetup. So, you know, keep your eyes peeled for that. We'll be um, live in our Facebook group and in the uh, twi on Twitter hashtag and the handle Vanguard at Vanguard STEM and hashtag Vanguard STEM for the rest of the year and you know forever and always. Uh, but the show itself won't resume again until after the new year, and you will be able to catch up on that and when that's going to happen uh, by following us on the social medias. So that's gonna be your biggest indication for that. I'm really excited about all that we're gonna create. Let me just say that that survey is literally like a five minute survey. It's not, we are not asking you for all of the things. We just want a couple of the things um, just to get your sense of what you liked about the show, what you'd like to see different about the show. Who did you love? Do you wanna see um, some of the people we've had back? Are there subjects that you wanna talk about um, that we can bring up? Are there um, people that you'd like to see on it? Do you want to be on the show? Like all of these things are critical pieces of information that we would love to have from you. Um, so definitely um, please fill in the survey and uh, participate on that. Uh, also, if you have questions or if you want to recommend someone for the show, you can just email info at jedidaisplerphd.com. That's probably one of the easiest ways. You can also just tweet at me. Um, I'll see that too. Or you can tweet at um, our hashtag. No, you can't tweet at hashtag. Um, you can tweet at Vanguard STEM and one of the members of our team will see it um, and we will work on it. So that's that's how that will go. Also, let me just say thank you again to our panelists. They were amazing, y'all, seriously. All the feels, like I'm all up in my feelings right now because I think back to the amazing women that participated in the show, uh, who shared themselves, who were vulnerable, who told us about the inner workings of how they think and what they're doing. Um, and how that impacted how we can go forward. I took some of the advice myself um, <laughs> into the world, and so I'm hoping that you also found it very helpful and uh, were able to use it. Um, if you want to participate, both either as a panelist or if you want to help put the show together, we are growing our team, so definitely let us know about that. Uh, let me thank also uh, Lana Hunter, who if you've been on the show, you will know she is amazing she helps us put the whole show together she keeps me in line so that the show get, makes it happen so that the show happens so she makes sure that i'm sitting in the right place at the right time uh she's been an, an incredible gift uh to jasmine johnson who as i said was one of the first um motivators of the idea um that um helped me to think through what something like this might look like and uh to google hangout for you know having hangouts because awesome. Uh, to Mark Hunter, who helps with some of the graphic design, I should say Jasmine Johnson designed our um, little uh, logo. So thank you so much, Jasmine, for doing that. Thank you to Mark Hunter for keep keeping up the, the graphics for us as we've gone through. Uh, thank you to those of, of, of you who have tweeted, who have put on Facebook, who have emailed your friends, who have made this show happen and have shared it with people um, and have really just supported this mission. Um, as a woman of color and as a black woman, uh, astrophysicist, it is imperative to me that young women of color and STEM, and by that I mean younger in the field, uh, younger in their pursuit, uh, have a space and a place that they can go and talk and get advice, all up in the field, y'all, uh, get advice and find comfort and community. So that's what this is. Uh, thank you so much for going along the journey with me. And I can't wait to see you next year. So you have a lovely, lovely break. Like I said, we're breaking from the show, not the Facebook group and not Twitter. So definitely hang out with us over there. And please do fill in the survey. If you haven't seen the link for the survey, ping us. We really would love for you to fill in the survey. So uh, thanks so much, y'all. It's been an incredible first season. I can't wait for season two. Can't wait for all that is going to happen and all the new stuff we're going to add. It's going to be amazing. Can't wait. Okay. 
So it's been my honor and my pleasure to host this show. I'll be back next season, and I cannot wait to see you there. You have a wonderful, wonderful evening, and a happy holiday.